Uh, last time we talked about the, uh, the kind of odd presence of race in the Great Gatsby, um, even though there's no uh, African American character in the Great Gatsby, um, there's a kind of undercurrent of allusions to race, um, especially in that uh, seemingly gratuitous scene when um, Nick and Gatsby are going to town in Gatsby's car, and they see this other car with three, um, two black men and white black women in the car driven by a white chauffeur. So that's a kind of very odd, gratuitous reference. Um, and I just want to um, pick up on that and push that a little further, uh, because there actually is a kind of a more important uh, connection uh, of African American music actually being very important, um, and I would say that jazz is, you know, started out as and is uh, still very much um, African American music. So um, Fitzgerald has written an essay. This is after the Great Gatsby, but a 1931 essay called Echoes of the Jazz Age, uh, and he says it was an age of miracles, it was an age of art, it was an age of access and it was an age of satire. So a lot of those terms, miracles, um, there's, um, you guys have probably noticed, uh, there's a very strong um, kind of um, religious language, uh, language of Christianity, son of God, uh, religious language in the Great Gatsby, um, and miracles would be within that domain of uh, r religious illusions. Um, but obviously uh, with uh, being remapped onto a secular context, uh, but um, certainly Gatsby is someone who would believe in miracles, uh, the miracle of turning time back and completely erasing um, a few years of um, Daisy's life. Uh, that's the miracle that really um, that he wants to achieve. Um, so miracles, what Fitzgerald associates with the jazz age, um, very much is a very important term for the great Gatsby access we know about, um, and age of art as well. Um, and there's actually an illusion um, in when Nick goes to um, Gatsby's party, the music that was playing um, is actually uh, the jazz history of the world. So lots of cross-references, basically a kind of a web, a web, a musical web that's been uh, woven into the great Gatsby uh, with jazz being the the, the, the genetic ground of that, of that web. Um, so because we're um, talking, and, and jazz is really imp was important to the 1920s, not just to Fitzgerald, but to the entire decade. So I um, just want to bring up some of the important figures. Uh, the piece called What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue, that's an especially resonant piece. Uh, it started out with um, Fess Waller singing it in Ain't Misbehaving. Um, and then um, it was picked up, both played on the trumpet, but also sung by Louis Armstrong. Um, and, oh, for, oh, the, uh, and, um, the, and then this is an allusion uh, to uh, Louis Armstrong. Um, there's, there's an allusion to Louis Armstrong um, in Ralph Allison's um, Invisible Man, and um, for some reason that um, is not showing up here, so I, would, I must, must have erased that when I was um, getting ready for this. So I'll just read this to you. This is the opening of Ralph Allison's Invisible Man. Um, then somehow I came out of it, ascending hastily from this underground of sound to hear Louis Armstrong innocently asking, what did I do to be so black and blue? Um, so it very much is something that started out in music and then crossed over um, into literature uh, and basically it was kind of the um, under the, line uh, conceit for uh, Ralph Allison's Invisible Man. I'll put this back um, on the PowerPoint when I uh, post it to the website. Um, oh, it's right here. <laughs> uh, my computer is playing tricks on me. Okay, so this is the passage, um, and we can um, talk about um, music as um, furnishing uh, a kind of chromatic uh, spectrum to, uh, to a linguistic medium, right? You know, we don't um, think of language necessarily um, as having colors, 
Um, but language very much has colors um, in The Great Gatsby. It's very, very striking. Um, blue, blue garden, yellow music, the blue honey of the Mediterranean, um, numerous instances of um, color being used in very abstract ways um, to describe the, uh, as, as a kind of operation, basic operation of the linguistic medium. So, um, so based on, on this, uh, the kind of the cross mapping of music uh, onto, the, onto language um, and, and, and the generation of color as well, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of very, very odd um, that um, sight and sound are being combined um, in this kind of cross mapping. So I want to bring this back um, to the word that we uh, heard last time from Maxwell Perkins, um, his complaint really that the Great Gatsby is very vague, um, that not enough physical details, not enough info really about Gatsby. Um, and uh, last time we talked about it in terms of what I would call counter-realism. Um, and um, today I'd like to talk about that, that sensation of vagueness. Um, I'd like to talk about that in terms of uh, cross-mapping of sight and sound, because this is not something that we do all the time. Um, it's not common usage. Uh, it can create impression of fakeness, even though once we get used to it, you know, it's just a wonderful um, um, strategy that uh, Fitzgerald is using. Uh, so the, the three headings that I'd like to um, use uh, for this kind of cross-mapping uh, is, first of all, uh, auditory feel with colors. Uh, we've already seen a little bit of that uh, when Fitzgerald is, is seemingly uh, talking just about sound, um, but colors um, uh, operative uh, in those descriptions. Um, and then the kind of obverse of that the visual feel with sound or with noise, lots of noise, the same, exactly symmetrical to that, but um, happening on the um, visual end. Um, and then the, the third, really, this is the, the kind of the central structure that I'd like to um, talk about today, um, is this kind of visual uh, auditory coupling as thematic coupling. So first of all, we see um, two characters in the same visual or the same auditory tableau, two people uh, seemingly accidentally being paired together. We just see them together. That's the visual impact of that uh, image. Um, and um, it turns out that that visual logic, that visual uh, mode of association actually has thematic implications. So the visual auditory coupling turning into a thematic coupling. It's a very complicated structure, but I do think that this is something that uh, Fitzgerald works very hard to create. And this is one of the, the just, just miraculous, I would say, um, um, uh, architecture, architectural features of the novel. Um, so um, first, let's um, just think about uh, the auditory feel with colors. Um, and this is uh, actually just uh, still at Gatsby's party and Nick talking about um, what he hears there, but something else as well. Um, the lights grow brighter as the earth lurches away from the sun. And now the orchestra is playing yellow cocktail music and the opera of voices pitches a key higher. Um, so it, he's really hearing the music. This is the occasion when the jazz history of the world is being played. Um, but it seems that it's impossible to talk about qualities of sound uh, without thinking of visual images and not even visual images uh, of the people who were there, although there are, certainly there are plenty of descriptions of those people. But right now, um, it's a very, very uh, cosmic vision uh, of the world. Um, the earth lurches away from the sun. It's on that kind of cosmic scale, astronomical scale, um, that the yellow cocktail music uh, is pitching into. Um, so that, really, the cosmic reference is coming out of nowhere. You know, it's very surprising. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure uh, what to say about it, other than that it seems very deliberate on on Fitzgerald Park. So once again, um, lots and lots of really interesting details and packed moments um, that invite us, basically compel us um, to give interpretation to 
Um, so this is one end of the spectrum on the trade field with colors. Um, and so let's go to the other end of the spectrum, the visual optical field with noise. Um, and this is, once again, very early uh, when uh, Nick goes to uh, the Buchanan household for the first time. Um, and this is, um, he sees, he, Daisy is his cousin, he hasn't seen her for a while. Um, the first image um, that he has of Daisy is actually not of Daisy alone. Uh, but she's on this couch with another young woman. The only completely stationary object in the room was an enormous couch on which two young women were buoyed up as though upon an anchored ballroom, balloon. Sorry, They were both in white, and the dresses were rippling and fluttering as if they had just been blown back in after a short flight around the house. I must have stood for a few moments listening to the whip and snap of the curtains and the groan of the picture on the wall. Then there was a boom as Tom Buchanan shut the rear windows and the cold wind died out about the room and the curtains and the rugs and the two young women ballooned slowly to the floor. Um, it's an amazing image. Uh, and it, set, it says a lot about the Buchanan household. It says a lot about Daisy. Uh, basically, it's really an, a, a visual uh, allegory for the entire novel. Um, the entire novel, The Great Gatsby, can be seen as Daisy ballooning, ballooning up and taking flight, uh, going back to that earlier romance um, with um, with Gatsby, uh, but really it's just a very, very short trip and she's going to be brought down to earth by Tom. Um, so it's uh, really interesting that um, there should be this um, uh, intensification uh, of what might seem uh, a very neutral or very casual uh, visual image into something that carries tremendous thematic weight, right? This is basically the whole story of the Great Gatsby is being encapsulated, encapsulated in this one visual image. Um, and what allows this visual image to have such tremendous thematic weight is actually the intrusion of sound into that, into that image. Um, if they had not been sound, it would not have been so pregnant with meaning. And the sound has to do with the whip and snap of the curtains. Um, it just remarkable words to use. Um, curtains, you know, they don't make sounds like a, a whip or um, they don't make snapping sounds. Um, so clearly this is the superimposition of something else, much more uh, brutal, much more violent images being superimposed, auditory images being superimposed upon the otherwise very benign and very harmless sound made by the curtain. Um, so already, the whip and the snap are already paving the auditory ground for the appearance of Tom Buchanan, so that when he finally appears towards the end of the passage, um, it's almost not surprising, even though he doesn't show up until the last sentence of the passage, the snap and whip of the curtains already um, carry his signature. So you know, it's really interesting that Tom Buchanan is a very physical man. He's, we know him by his physical attributes, his body filling up every inch of his clothes, uh, his riding boots, and so on. Uh, a very visual figure. But nonetheless, uh, Fitzgerald is careful to give an auditory dimension to Tom. And then the final auditory act that he does is to bring down, shut the rear window. This is not the rear door, but it's the rear window almost as good. Somebody is trying to get into his house by the back door or the back window, um, and Tom Buchanan is shutting that right then and there before any action is taken place. So, you know, this is a forecast of the rest of the novel. Um, it is um, basically a, it's just a capsule summary of everything that we need to know about The Great Gatsby. Um, so, um, just to see how carefully crafted this is, um, because this is already made, because this comes to us ready made, um, we don't notice how how much um, craftsmanship actually goes into that passage. 
So I just want to show you a visual image that is almost similar to this uh, by a very pa famous painter, uh, Manet. Um, and this is um, a picture called Beauvais Mistress Reclining. Uh, we also see the curtains in there. But we just know that those curtains are not going to make a noise like a whip, or they're not going to be making um, whipping or snapping sounds. So this is in contrast to Fitzgerald. This is a visual feel without noise. It is completely visual. Um, it doesn't carry the auditory signature and auditory manners um, that uh, is encoded um, in Fitzgerald's very careful coupling of sight and sound in his description. Um, so um, we also know uh, that Daisy doesn't appear by herself, right? So it's very, very important that she and Jordan Baker, that the first glimpse that we have is of the two of them on that enormous couch, uh, and both occupants of a visual field that is, carries noise. So that is the first common thing between Jordan Baker and Daisy. Let's go on to see if that visual auditory coupling, uh, what does that mean in thematic terms? How does that translate into features of the plot that maybe would also bring the two of them together? Um, so I'm telling you what I'm going to argue with. This is just the outline of the lecture, and then we'll um, do the same thing uh, with Gatsby and Nick as well. But let's just this. Um, just move on to Jordan Baker. Um, and um, last time we talked about the importance of uh, the car of Gatsby's Rolls Royce. Um, and the car really is a key player in The Great Gatsby in all kinds of contexts. So it turns out that um, Jordan Baker, uh, one very important um, aspect of the relation to Nick Ashley revolves around um, the car. It was on that same house party that we had a curious conversation about driving a car. It started because she passed so close to some workman that our fender flicked a button on one man's coat. You're a rotten driver, I protested. Either you ought to be more careful or you aren't to drive at all. I am careful. No, you're not. Well, other people are, she said lightly. What's that got to do with it? They'll keep out of my way, she insisted. It takes two to make an accident. So this says a lot about the relation between Nick and uh, Jordan Baker and why it might come to nothing. Um, so you know, there are actually lots of little local allegories of the entire plot all the way throughout The Great Gatsby. Um, and the fact that she's um, a bad driver who's counting on other people being careful uh, to prevent accidents from happening, that is not a good basis to get into a marriage with. And Nick seems to know that. So I mean, this is really one of the many signs that this is not going to come to anything. Um, but what is also interesting, I think, about this particular um, image of Jolene Baker coming by way of her relation to the automobile is a notion of accountability that is perhaps not just limited to Jordan Baker herself. It is really an account, uh, an explanation of why things go wrong and one's responsibility, one's input, one's contribution to the fact that something is going wrong. And for Jordan Baker, accountability is almost always written over to the other side. If there's an accident, it's because the other person isn't a good driver. That's why there's an accident. Taking, not taking into account at all the fact that she's also a bad driver. Um, it's just right that it takes two to make an accident. Um, but the, the explanation that she's looking for is that it is the other person's fault. Um, and we'll see that there are other characters in um, the novel who share that understanding of accountability, um, kind of a straight attribution of thought to the other side. Um, so let's see um, 
what they say, how they say relates to the car, and it turns out that she also has a very extremely non-trivial relation to the car. Um, this is while well, they're leaving that um, terrible scene in New York when basically Gatsby is just falling apart. Uh, but he's, Tom um, allows him to drive Daisy back. So Nick, uh, so Gatsby and Daisy are in the car, and this is um, Gatsby telling Nick what happened. When we left New York, she was very nervous, and she thought it was steady for her to drive. And this woman rushed out of the, at us just as we were passing the car coming the other way. It all happened in a minute, but it seemed to me that she wanted to speak to us, thought we were somebody she knew. Well, first Daisy turned away from the woman toward the other car, and then she lost her nerve and turned mm -hmm. back. So that's the death of Myrtle at the hand of Daisy. And um, it is not intentional, and I think that this says a lot about Daisy. Um, Fitzgerald is not portraying uh, a bad person, really. Um, she is a bad driver because she's lost her nerve. Um, and we really have to be pretty careful um, in our assignment of blame. Um, I think that Jordan Baker is a very almost too clear assignment of blame in putting it squarely um, on the other person's side. Um, and Fitzgerald is actually quite careful um, about um, saying what kind of a woman Daisy is. She's just not a very brave person. Um, and she's not a very feisty person. She doesn't have steadily stead sturdiness of nerve. Um, and she loses her nerve at a critical moment, both at this very critical moment, but also uh, in a kind of abstract way, uh, when Gatsby needed her to stand by him. She's really not there for him. Um, so this is the kind of person she is, and it comes out most dramatically um, in her handling of the car. Um, but it also comes out in the way that she handles other affairs of life as well. Um, so in all those ways, we see the same kind of logic um, that we saw last time, that is very important human attributes are rooted, uh, channeled through um, our relation to objects. Um, Daisy's relation to the car says a lot how, about how she would behave in other uh, strictly human contexts of interaction. Um, so Jordan Baker and Daisy were joined together at the very beginning uh, by virtue of that visual tableau. And it turns out that it actually is a very deep connection. Right? They're both bad drivers, uh, although for bad reasons. So you know, we have to be careful as well. They're both bad drivers. But in the case of Jordan Baker, she's just much more cavalier about the whole thing, whereas Daisy is just, not, is just incompetent and not very skilled and lacking nerve. Um, so let's turn on, turn back now to um, another coupling. Um, and you guys will notice that I'm not talking about um, Gatsby and Daisy, the most obvious couple in The Great Gatsby. Uh, but I want to talk about that couple uh, in a roundabout fashion, actually, by way of Nick and Gatsby. Um, and I just want to go back to one very small point that we talked about much earlier. Um, and which is about the legacy of World War I, right? So we know that Nick and Gatsby have this in common. They both fought in World War I, and um, they both named the, 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 the units that they were in. Um, so Nick was in the 9th Machine Gun Battalion, and Gatsby was in the 7th Infantry, um, very precise in naming the number of that unit. Um, so already we know that there's a prior connection uh, between the two of them. And I would argue that they also have an ongoing connection as well, uh, because they are both very, very uh, sensitive to, responsive to, and captivated by a certain quality of sound that resides in Daisy's voice. So um, it's very, very odd that Nick, who is, has no romantic attachment, to Daisy um, should be captivated in almost exactly the same way that Gatsby is captivated. It doesn't actually take a romantic attachment for it to be completely within the powers 
of a certain quality of voice. So Nick, talking about Basie's voice, it was the kind of voice that the ear follows up and down, as if each speech is an arrangement of notes that would never be played again. Her face was sad and lovely, with bright things in it, bright eyes, and a bright, passionate mouth. But there was an excitement in her voice that men who had cared for her found difficult to forget, a singing compulsion, a whispered listen. Um, when we look at the visual description of Daisy, um, it's not very striking. Fitzgerald using very, very generic words to talk about Daisy. Her face is sad and lovely with bright things in it. Almost no actual description of the, phys of the physical features on Daisy's face. So it actually is a kind of very blurry um, image of Daisy. We know that supposedly she's beautiful, but we don't actually know in what way she's the exact features that render her beautiful. Um, it is her voice that gives a very exact rendition of Daisy. It is a voice that nobody can forget, and nobody who cares about her can forget. Um, and in this case, it is really the intonation of mortality, right? And I think that voice, um, well, I mean, now we can capture, obviously, can, you know, the sound recording makes that less uh, of a, a, a kind of a intonation of mortality, but um, if it's just, just a voice that you hear for that one moment and you never hear it again, you do um, have the sense that it's just that one time and uh, it will uh, never again be heard again. Uh, you know, if you go to a concert that's not being recorded, then you just know that this is it. Um, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and so that partly accounts for um, the compulsion that comes from Daisy's voice. Um, that um, it both is an in intimation of all her, her mortality and it's an intimation of mortality on the part of the person who's listening to her. Um, let's look at one other description of Daisy's voice coming from Nick. Uh, this is something that we actually uh, read before, but I just thought that I would read it again. For a moment, the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me forward breathlessly as I listened. Then the glow faded, each light <coughs> deserting her with a lingering regret, like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. Um, and this is actually in the context of um, Nick. Uh, this is the visit to the Buchanan household. Um, and Nick is just uh, about to find out about Tom's affair with Myrtle. Um, so in some sense, the kind of the fading light is also um, a kind of a prelude, uh, or perhaps even an allegory of uh, the rapidly fading light, even in the course of that evening, as the phone rings, all the light goes out uh, of everyone's face, uh, and so uh, it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's the it's the quality of sound that register that registers a dramatic uh, development in that in that episode. Um, so let's look, um, so, you know, as I said, Nick really, you know, doesn't have a deep relation um, to, to Daisy, uh, but he has a very deep relation to Daisy's voice. Um, and Gatsby, who has a very deep relation to Daisy, also has a very deep relation to Daisy's voice as well. Um, and this is the moment uh, when he's meeting Daisy after all these years um, in Nick's house, um, and uh, we'll read that passage a little later. Um, but Nick conjectures that he's been keeping her in his heart for so long that this is actually not the big moment for him. This is actually the moment of the letdown, that here is this woman he's been waiting for all these years, doing everything, building up his whole life towards this moment, um, and it's a kind of a letdown. Um, and so he, Nick is noticing that in Gatsby. And then something else happens. As I watch him, he adjusted himself visibly. His hand took hold of hers, and as she said something low in his ear, he turned toward her with a rush of emotion. I think that voice held him most with its fluctuating, feverish warmth because it couldn't be overdreamed. That voice 
was a deathless song. So everything else about Daisy actually could be and is overdreamed, and Gatsby almost knows that, that he's projected much too much onto Daisy. There's no way she can live up to all the projections of all those years that he's been enveloping her in. Um, so she, no one, no human being, it's not just that Daisy can live up to that kind of massive um, projection on the part of, of Gatsby. No human being can. But one thing about Daisy can stand up to that magnification, emotional magnification and amplification on the part of Daisy, of, of, of Gatsby, and that is her voice. Um, every time, any time he hears her voice, he's captivating captivated by her over and over again, as if everything is really starting right at that moment. So the voice for Daisy um, captures the possibility of fresh beginning. Um, it seems to have come to an end. It seems to have arrived at the moment where uh, Gatsby is finally disillusioned uh, with Daisy. And then that he hears that voice again, and it's almost as if it's a fresh start. And this is really what Fitzgerald talks about, about the new world and the fresh green breast of the new world at the very end of, of the Great Gatsby is that some people actually have the capability for endless new beginnings. You know, you think that they've come to the end of the road uh, and or that they come to the end of the dream um, and all of a sudden <laughs> they're starting up all over again. Um, and that's really what's impressive uh, about Gatsby, sad and pathetic about Gatsby as well, but also impressive. Um, is that he can always start again, that passion for Gatsby can always start afresh um, because of the quality of Daisy's sound. But Gatsby is not so captivated <laughs> or so blindly in love that he doesn't know what is in that voice, what constitutes that voice, or what gives the voice its magical power. So this is actually a surprisingly uh, cleared eye evaluation of Daisy's voice from Gatsby. Her voice is full of money, he said suddenly. That was it. I never understood before. It was full of money. That was the inexhaustible charm that rose and fell in it, the jingle of it, the symbol song of it, high in the white palace, the king's daughter, the golden girl. So usually people who are madly in love are not so great at analyzing the nature of the object that they love. <laughs> but um, in a kind of surprising move, um, Gatsby actually is very analytical here and completely right um, that that really is the power of Daisy, uh, that in some sense she is the golden girl in a very literal sense, that it is the goal that makes for that goldenness of Daisy. Um, that uh, that's really what creates her, that gives her her initial uh, magic over uh, Gatsby when he was just a poor young boy. Um, and that's what makes for the continual magic of Daisy. Um, that yes, this is an Asian miracle, um, as, um, as, as Fitzgerald says in, um, about jazz, um, but it is an Asian miracle um, underwritten by the miracle creating power of gold. Um, this is really what the novel is about, is um, this, this magic in this world, um, but it's coming from uh, basically an inanimate, non-human source. Um, and um, a human being can quite often be the creation of that miracle working substance gold. Um, so, um, so far we've seen the two of them uh, being completely catch, captivated by, by Daisy's voice. Um, but Nick and Gatsby also have something else in common as well. Um, and in that, even though sound is what keeps them going for a good part of the novel, um, actually, at some point, sound is also extinguished for them. So let's look at the mode by which sound is being extinguished for each of them. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, those come at the end of the novel because when sound is distinguished, that's also a signal that the novel is coming to an end. So here is um, Nick actually 
watching mm -hmm. Tom and Daisy after the accident when Tom and Daisy are back in the house. Um, and Nick is outside, mm -hmm. and so he's watching the two of them, and all he can see is this visual mm -hmm. tableau of Tom and um, Daisy, but he can hear what they are saying. Um, and I think we can't really actually get a more dramatic moment when you can only see but not hear. Daisy and Tom were sitting opposite each other at the kitchen table with a plate of cold fried chicken between them and two bottles of ale. He was talking intently across the table at her, and in his earnestness, his hand had fallen upon and covered her own. Once in a while, she looked up at him and nodded in agreement. They weren't happy, and neither of them had touched the chicken or the ale, and yet they weren't unhappy either. There was an unmistakable air of natural intimacy about the picture, and anybody would have said that they were conspiring together. So this actually is a happy ending in heavy quotation marks uh, for Daisy and Tom, the reconstitution of that marriage um, that had come under so much threat from both sides, Myrtle and Gatsby. And this is another way in which Myrtle and Gatsby um, are linked together. They're both um, the people coming from a different social circle. Um, trying to destroy that marriage. Um, they are not successful, the marriage survives. Um, and this is the comedy, this is the happy ending for Tom and Daisy. And the nature of that comedy, and obviously I'm being very ironic here, the nature of the comedy um, is that uh, it's just the two of them. So you know, really the marriage is between the two of them. Uh, even her cousin can only watch uh, but cannot actually hear what is being said between the two of them. Um, so this is um, a happy moment for uh, Tom and Daisy that for Nick has to be experienced as silence uh, from the part of Daisy and from Tom. He's so used to hearing her voice in this one um, instant. He's not hearing her voice at all, and that's because she's talking to Tom, she's not talking to Nick. So um, let's look at a comparable uh, symmetrical moment of sound being extinguished uh, by Gatsby. This is a truly unforgettable moment. And uh, once again, the, the, all the objects that uh, we've seen, um, all the objects that are important in the first part of The Great Gatsby actually come back and play a very important part. So the, sound, the extinguishing of sound for Gatsby in, towards the end of The Great Gatsby actually comes by way of the telephone. Um, nothing coming through to him from the telephone. He was waiting for, obviously, for a call from Daisy. No telephone message arrived, but the butler went without his sleep and waited for it until four o'clock, until long after there was anyone to give it to if it came. I have an idea that Gatsby himself didn't believe it would come, and perhaps he no longer cared. If that was true, he must have felt that he had lost the old warm world, paid a high price for living too long with a single dream. He must have looked up at an unfamiliar sky through frightening leaves and shivered as he found what a grotesque thing a rose is, and how raw the sunlight was upon the scarcely created grass. Um, we see the very carefully planned transition from the silence of the telephone, once again, to a strictly visual tableau. Um, so this is exactly symmetrical um, to the scene witnessed by Nick, um, the suspension, uh, non-appearance of sound, um, and then the domination of the visual field. And now, finally, this is a visual field without sound. It hasn't been the case before. It's been a visual field with sound. Here is a moment when we get the visual field without sound, and all of a sudden, it's a grotesque field. We don't tend to think of the rose as a very grotesque thing. But when you're that up close to the rose, when you're seeing it in such minute features, the rose becomes a very grotesque thing, unbearable to look at, really. 
Um, and that's really what the world is for, for, for Gatsby at that point. So um, right now we've um, talked about the two of them, um, Nick and Gatsby, as if they were almost exactly alike, right? You know, they seem, there's this very strong symmetry between the two of them. But obviously this is really not exactly our experience of those two characters either as we read the, the Greek Gatsby. The two of them are not so exactly alike that they are so, that they're interchangeable. Um, so um, I want now to start another uh, train of thought that actually points to a difference between Nick and Gatsby. Um, Nick and Gatsby uh, have a very important common ground up to a certain point, and then they diverge after, after the point. So let's trace the divergence between them. It turns out that Sang is extinguished uh, for Nick in two dramatic scenes. Not hearing Daisy talking to Tom, that's one moment, but there's another one, not as dramatic, but equally consequential for him. Um, and actually, it also comes by way of a phone conversation. So at least there's that symmetry between him and, Nick and, 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 and Gatsby as well. Um, but here's uh, Nick talking to Jordan Baker. Suppose I don't go to Southampton. Uh, this is after the accident. Uh, suppose I don't go to Southampton and come into town this afternoon. No, I don't think this afternoon. Very well. It's impossible this afternoon. Various, we talked like that for a while. And then abruptly, we weren't, sorry, we weren't talking any longer. I didn't know which of us hung up with a sharp click, but I know I didn't care. So here too is a phone conversation that simply turns into a non-conversation and then silence descending on the two of them. So it seems, this scene obviously is very, very close to the silence of the telephone for Gatsby, but there is a crucial difference. Nick had conjectured earlier that Gatsby didn't care if the phone call came or not, but that's obviously not true. How could he not care? It was devastating, it was devastating that there was no phone call from, 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 from Daisy. But this is a moment when Nick truly doesn't really care. And he doesn't care because of who he is. So now we've come to a very important parting of the ways between Nick and Gatsby. Gatsby is someone who actually cares so much that it's almost as if he, there's no reason for him to live after that moment. Um, and so you know, it's fitting that he should die right then and there. Um, the plot almost kind of reflecting his psychology. Um, but Nick is someone who doesn't care and who survives in some sense because he doesn't care. So here's a moment to go back to um, something that Fitzgerald and uh, Hemingway actually have in common. We talk a lot about the logic of substitution in Hemingway and especially the um, picador's horse being a substitute for the picador uh, when a boy is charging. Um, so there's a very important logic of substitution in Hemingway. And it turns out that there's also a logic of substitution in the great Gatsby as well, in, if only because the word substitute is actually used by Fitzgerald, um, once again in a seemingly gratuitous context. So this is the family history of Nick Carraway. The actual founder of my line was my grandfather's brother, who came here in 51, sent a substitute to the Civil War, and started the wholesale hardware business that my father carries on today. Okay, this entire passage, when we first read it, seems to have nothing to do with the rest of the novel. You know, why would we care whether or not back one generation and not even his grandfather, but his grand, his uncle, grand uncle, um, uh, sent a substitute. They didn't fight. So I mean, this actually has a lot in common with the Hemingway story. This is someone who doesn't fight his own battle. It sends a substitute to fight for him and to suffer for him in the Civil War. Um, and um, and then as a consequence of surviving, because of not having died in the Civil War, being able to 
found a very successful hardware business. So all these details about Nick's family history, at the moment when it appears uh, very early, first opening pages of The Great Gatsby, um, seems simply just to stand there and to be doing nothing. And it's only in hindsight that um, we can impute a meaning, we can retrospectively impute a meaning to that original seemingly gratuitous detail. Um, and it really has to do with the vital difference between Gatsby and Nick. And here is this moment when just before uh, Gatsby is captivated by Daisy's voice again. This is the moment of this illusion, but also re-illusion um, that, that Nick is noticing in Gatsby. Uh, there must have been moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy stumbles short of his dreams, not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. He had thrown in himself into it with a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man can store up in his ghostly heart. So this is really why Gatsby is what he is, is that he has this enormous storage capacity in his ghostly heart. And it will store, Daisy will be stored there forever. It almost doesn't matter who she is, what she really turns out to be. And what he finds, what he realized, what he finally realized is what she is. It almost doesn't matter. It has no relation to reality at all because it is strictly a dream about Daisy that Gatsby has stored up in his own heart and mind. So the colossal vitality of illusion, and that is what death is about Daisy in Gatsby's own mind, and what enables Gatsby to be deathless to some extent as well, in spite of his physical, biological death. Um, with Nick, it's the other way around. So just want to read you um, why he doesn't care, um, and why it turns out that his family business is the, is the hardware business. Um, it is someone who can never be heard by anything that happens uh, to him. Jordan Baker was incurably dishonest. She wasn't able to endure being at a disadvantage. And given this unwillingness, I suppose she had begun dealing in subterfuges when she was very young in order to keep that cool, insolent smile turned to the world and yet satisfy the demands of her heart, jaunty body. We have seen Gatsby being very analytical about Daisy, right? that she is, her voice is full of money. And here is Nick <coughs> performing a comparable analytic operation on Jordan Baker, that she's just incurably dishonest. She can bear to lose. She would do anything she can to win. He is right, dead right about Jordan Baker. That's why you know the marriage is not going to to take place. But more than that, it's not even that she's not such a great marriage companion. Um, it is that Nick really doesn't even care enough to be hurt by that realization. Um, he is insulated by the emotional hardware that has been his family's business for these two generations. Um, and so that's why the family history is so important to Nick and why he really needs a substitute. Uh, because he's simply incapable of feeling the kind of ecstasy that Gatsby is capable of feeling, nor is he capable of feeling the devastation that Gatsby is capable of feeling. Those two go hand in hand. You get ecstasy, you get devastation. Um, Nick is not capable of either. Um, and that's why he's such a good he's such good friends with, with Gatsby. Well, he's always standing by Gatsby, because he really needs that indirect experience of what it feels to be in Gatsby's mind and to have that ghostly heart with his miraculous storage capacity. Um, so anyway, um, this is um, um, a kind of 
Fitzgerald's way of encouraging us to think about different constellations, right? Different configurations, different constellations of characters. Um, and Nick and Gatsby, not the most obvious couple, uh, but it turns out that actually the whole story of the great Gatsby can be told by looking at this non-traditional couple. Uh, and I'll encourage you in section to think of other non-traditional couples as well. And we'll turn to, uh, Fist, uh, to Faulkner next week. <laughs>